ಸಂಸ್ಥಾಪಕಾಯ ಚ ಧರ್ಮಸ್ವಿಣಿ ಅವತಾರವರಿಷ್ಠಾಯ ರಾಮಕೃಷ್ಣಾಯ ನಮಃ ಗುಡ್ ಮಾರ್ನಿಂಗ್ ಎವ್ರಿ ಒನ್ ಆನ್ ದಿಸ್ ಓವರ್ ಕ್ಯಾಸ್ ಸಂಡೇ ಐ ಥಿಂಕ್ ದರ್ ಮೈ ಪಿ ಎನ್ ಎಲ್ ಎ ಮ್ಯಾರಥಾನ್ ಗೋಯಿಂಗ್ ಆನ್ ಆಸ್ ವಿ ಸ್ಪೀಕ್ ಸೊ ಪ್ರಾಪ್ಸ್ ಟು ಯು ಫಾರ್ ಆಕ್ಚುಲಿ ಕಮಿಂಗ್ ಔಟ್ ಇನ್ ಸ್ಪೈಟ್ ಆಫ್ ದ ಟ್ರಾಫಿಕ್ I want to discuss today a question that many people may not even think is a particularly important one. But I want to convince you that the question is important, that the answer is also important. The question is, what is the role of philosophy in spiritual life? Why do some people think that this is not an important question? Let's start with that. I think there are at least two reasons. Some people say, Well, I'm a spiritual aspirant. I'm talking about spiritual aspirants now. Everyone here and in general, people who are engaged in some kind of spiritual practice, many of them say, my priority is spiritual practice and philosophy is dry reasoning. What does that have to do with spiritual life? That could be good for some people, for certain specialists or something, or followers of a particular path, but not for everybody. Philosophy is not for everybody. I'm going to focus on sadhana, on spiritual practice. This is one common... attitude that people take toward philosophy another one is philosophy is good for a very specific type of spiritual aspirant namely followers of what's called the path of knowledge gyana yoga right which usually is explained in terms of shankara's advaita vedanta and you say brahman alone is real i am that non dual pure consciousness everything else is ultimately a dream it's not real that's philosophy but that's not for everybody i'm not if you're not a follower of the path of knowledge you say then philosophy is not for me so these are some these are some common attitudes about philosophy now the argument i want to make in today's talk is that both of these attitudes are wrong that there are misconceptions about philosophy and that every single spiritual aspirant in any religious tradition following any spiritual path is a philosopher now for those of you who have studied the teachings of shri ram krishna and the life of shri ram krishna especially the gospel of shri ram krishna you might object at this point you said well shri ram krishna was not particularly favorable toward philosophy in fact there's a very interesting well let me put it this way he he didn't know much english but he had a small repertoire of maybe half a dozen english words that he used to say once in a while very charmingly one of them was thank you we'll we'll get to that a little later while we're quoting it so he would say thank you in english but he also used the word philosophy in english in a bengali accent philosophy Philosophy June 30th 1884 it's recorded in the Kathamrita the Gospel of Sri Ram Krishna he's speaking to a great pundit Shashadhar and he says guchi shastra podle ki hobe philosophy is what he says in bangla which means what will you get by just reading a bunch of scriptures and and thinking about them uh, reasoning about them and then he just as an exclamation he says philosophy philosophy and everybody laughs First of all they're charmed by the fact that he used this very sophisticated English word but also because his point is don't get entangled in dry philosophical discussions focus on the goal the spiritual aim what is the aim there's a a very well known analogy he often uses he says you have come to the mango orchard to eat mangoes so don't bother to count the leaves and oh, how many mangoes and this and that you've come to eat the mangoes eat the mangoes am kete sho am khao right now i would suggest that when he when he uses the term philosophy here in this context he understands something very specific by it he means dry philosophical reasoning that is divorced from spiritual practice dry philosophical reasoning that is divorced from spiritual practice and that just taking this statement out in in isolation taking it out of context is not good enough 
the gospel is about a 1,200 page work, depending on which edition you're using and all that. But the whole unabridged gospel is very long, full of teachings. And one thing you'll find is that the gospel has two kinds of teaching. One is teachings about spiritual practice. It's full. The gospel is full of teachings about spiritual practices. Prayer, japa, bhajans, worship, the path of knowledge, karma yoga, selfless, the path of selfless action, all sorts of spiritual practices. But the gospel is also full of another kind of teaching, philosophical teachings. It's full of teachings about what is the nature of God. What is the relationship between God and the world? Who are we in our true essence? How are we related to God? He specifically refers to different philosophical schools in the Indian tradition. He refers to Advaita Vedanta. He refers to the Vaishnava tradition. He refers to Shankara's Advaita Vedanta. He refers to Ramanuja's Vishta Advaita by name. The gospel is full of philosophical teachings. So if he really felt that philosophy is unimportant in spiritual life, why would half of the gospel be taken up with philosophical teachings? This is the first question that I think is worth asking. So you should, I, I think you should not be too quick to just dismiss philosophy and spiritual life on the basis of the gospel, because I would say it's almost like a 50-50 split. If you look at Sri Ramakrishna's teachings on, on philosophy and look at his teachings on spiritual practice, they're almost even. And I would suggest that he saw them as inseparable. You cannot separate his teachings on philosophical doctrines from his teachings on spiritual practice. He saw them as inseparable. And in fact, philosophy, in some respects, is a form of spiritual practice. That's also something I want to uh, argue today. Now, another thing is, you know, the gospel, as I said, is so full of philosophical teachings. Swami Vivekananda himself once said to a devotee, he said, one can write shelves of philosophical books on the basis of any one of Sri Ramakrishna's philosophical teachings. And then this devotee was very skeptical. He said, I mean, you, you are prone to exaggeration. This is probably another exaggeration. And then he, he became excited and he said, give me any teaching of Sri Ramakrishna's and I'll give you a discourse about it. And he said, what about the Mahut Narayan parable? <laughs> the elephant god, okay? That elephant is also Narayana, but the but the uh, the Mahut, the person who's riding the elephant, is also Narayana. And according to this devotee who recorded this, for three days, Swami Vivekananda explained the philosophical subtleties, the nuances, the depths of this particular teaching of Sri Ramakrishna. So we should not underestimate the philosophical dimension of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings. There are many of them, and they're very very profound, and they require a lot of unpacking. And in fact, um, it was, I, I start my, my previous book, Infinite Paths to Infinite Reality, with this epigraph, Swami Vivekananda's epigraph. One can write shelves of philosophical books on the basis of any one of Sri Ramakrishna's teachings. And that, to me, that's a kind of inspiration to write at least one book. I've attempted to write one book just on his philosophical teachings and really trying to explore their philosophical nuances and their relevance to contemporary life. So. In the course of this talk, I want to explain specifically that there are six ways in which I think Sri Ramakrishna himself taught that philosophy is essential to spiritual life. Philosophy is essential to spiritual life. What are these six ways? So let me discuss these one by one. First, every single spiritual practice is based on particular philosophical ideas. There's no such thing as a spiritual practice that doesn't have a kind of philosophical underpinning of some sort, no matter how minimal, okay? If you look at the Buddha's Four Noble Truths, and especially the fourth noble truth, which is the sadhana, the spiritual practice, which is the Ashtanga Marga, the Eightfold Path. These are eight factors that he elaborates which are essential in spiritual life, the first factor is samyak drishti in Sanskrit. Samyak drishti means the right view, the right understanding of things, the right worldview. And Bhikkhu Bodhi, he's a very senior Buddhist monk in the Theravada tradition. He's an American monk with a PhD in philosophy, I think from Claremont College here in California. He has a really nice article 
um, on, on the Noble Eightfold Path and specifically explaining the importance of Samyak Drishti, the right view, as the foundation for the entire Buddhist spiritual practice. So I just wanted to share that with you. So Bhikkhu Bodhi says the following, right view is the forerunner of the entire path, the guide for all the other factors. It enables us to understand our starting point, our destination, and the successive landmarks to pass as practice advances. To attempt to engage in the practice without a foundation of right view is to risk getting lost in the futility of undirected movement. Doing so might be compared to wanting to drive someplace without consulting a roadmap or listening to the suggestions of an experienced driver. One might get into the car and start to drive, but rather than approaching closer to one's destination, one is more likely to move farther away from it. To arrive at the desired place, one has to have some idea of its general direction and of the roads leading to it. So I think this is a really nice explanation of the importance of a clear philosophical understanding of reality as a basis for all spiritual practice. This doesn't just apply to the Buddhist path. It applies to all paths. If you look at any of the Hindu spiritual traditions, Patanjali's Yoga Sutra, many of you have probably read at least parts of it. You'll find that Patanjali's Ashtanga Yoga, the sadhanas, yama, niyama, so ethical practices, meditative practices, all of them are grounded in the metaphysics of Sankhya. Patanjali's yoga philosophy and yoga practice is based on the metaphysics of Sankhya philosophy, which is based on this dualism of Purusha and Prakriti. And the whole aim of all the spiritual practices taught in Patanjali's Yoga Sutra is to realize our true nature as Purushas, as eternal souls, separate from the body-mind complex, separate from nature with a capital N. So again, you see how every single spiritual practice, even in yoga philosophy, is also based on certain philosophical doctrines, metaphysical views. This is equally true of the Bhagavad Gita. This is just like the gospel in a way. I see the gospel in a way as, as a modern day Bhagavad Gita in many respects, but in this respect as well. If you look at the Gita, in, in, traditionally when you chant the Gita in Sanskrit, at the end of every chapter there's a colophon where you refer to the Gita as Brahma Vidyayam Yoga Shastri. It's both Brahma, it's a text teaching Brahma Vidya, the highest truths about Brahman, and it's a yoga shastra. It's a practical spiritual manual. It's a man of, manual of spiritual practice. But it's both at the same time. And if you study all 18 chapters of the Gita, you'll find that again and again. Some of the shlokas, some of the verses refer to spiritual practices. And immediately Krishna will shift gears and talk about very lofty philosophical ideas, spiritual ideas. And because the two are inseparable, very much in the way that Sri Ramakrishna's philosophical teachings are inseparable from his teachings on spiritual practice. So now, let's come to some of Sri Ramakrishna's own philosophical teachings and kind of ex ask ourselves, how, how might they be related to spiritual practice? I'll give you just three examples because I have many other things I want to cover as well. But I want to focus on three different kinds of philosophical teachings. One is, throughout the gospel, you find Sri Ramakrishna talking again and again about the nature of God. Jini nirgun tini shogun, he says in Bangla, which means that divine reality which is impersonal and without attributes is also personal and with attributes. He would also teach, similarly, brummo o shokti abhed, the impersonal, static Brahman, non-dual pure consciousness, is inseparable from shakti, by which he means the personal God who creates, preserves, and destroys this universe. He says elsewhere, when I think of God as static, as inactive, nishkriyo, then I call it Brahman. When I think of that same divine reality as creating, preserving, and destroying the universe, I call it Kali or Shakti. Same reality seen from different standpoints. So why is this relevant? Why does he keep insisting on this? Why does he teach us if it's not relevant to spiritual life? Because it is relevant to spiritual life. How? Think about any, like take a typical bhakta devotee of the personal God. What are some of the typical spiritual practices? Japa, which means mental repetition of God's name, a mantra referring to God's name. Bhajans, worship of God in the form of singing, in the form of chanting, 
Smarana Marana is another practice, Sharan Monon in Bengali, is another practice that Sri Ramakrishna would of, often recommend. Recollection, constant recollection of God, thinking of God. Prayer is something that he often recommends. These are all very, very common spiritual practices that most of us probably practice in our daily lives. Praying to God. Notice that each one of these practices, bhakti practices, presuppose some at least rudimentary understanding of who is it that we're addressing. In prayer, who is, if we're devotees of Sri Ramakrishna, who is Sri Ramakrishna? If we're devotees of Jesus, who is Jesus? That's why Sri Ramakrishna gives us a clue. First of all, understand what God is. Then you can pray to him or her. That's also a philosophical question. Is God him or her or it? Hinduism says all three. <laughs> In Patanjali's Yoga Sutra 1.28, Book 1, uh, Sutra 28, tad taj japas tad atta bhavanam. You should do japa of the name of God. And here in Patanjali's system, there's no exact God in the, in the sense of a personal God, but in any case, so it's Om. They're thinking of Om. But like, okay, so tad japas tad atta bhavanam. But in general, what it means is we can take the essence of this as when you repeat a mantra, a divine mantra, you should not just mechanically repeat it. You should also be contemplating the meaning of that mantra. Tad atta bhavanam. Atta here means meaning. I'm reminded of a pretty startling remark that Sri Ramakrishna makes in one place in the gospel. He's talking about japa, and then suddenly he says, I've seen even the prostitutes in Kolkata do japa. <laughs> They're also telling beads. In the same way that all these other people are doing. Not in the same way, that's what he's saying. But just repeating, just telling beads is not enough. What's the attitude behind it? What's the bhava? That's, that's the Bengali and Sanskrit word behind it, with which you do the japa. Are you th when you're taking God's name, are you thinking of God as something supreme and something worth adoring and worshiping and thinking about? That's tadatta bhavanam in Patanjali's 1.28. And by contrast, there's a very interesting incident, also I think in the gospel, where Hazra is doing japa. He's always doing japa. So Sri Ramakrishna says, give me that. And he takes his, his mala, his rosary beads once, and he says, let me try. And he, and he just repeats, he tells the bead, I think, once or twice, repeating the name of God, and immediately goes into a state of transcendental samadhi. That's because he's doing tad japa stadatta bhavanam. It's not just mechanical repetition like Hazra seems to be doing. He's always doing it, but he doesn't seem to be making much spiritual progress. But Sri Ramakrishna tries to tell the beads, but the moment he takes God's name once, he go, goes into a very high state of samadhi, of spiritual ecstasy. What's the difference? It's because he's doing japa with that deeper philosophical, theological understanding of who God is, whose name he's actually taking, the glory of God the wonder of God, the love that is God. So that's one example, but let me give you two other examples of Sri Ramakrishna's philosophical teachings and in what way they form the basis of spiritual practice. So another thing you'll find in the gospel is that they're full of teachings on what he calls vigyana, the spiritual state of vigyana. He says, for instance, vigyani dekhe jini nirgun tini shogun. It's the vigyani who sees that the divine reality is not just the impersonal Brahman, but also the personal God, Shakti. And he says that Brahman, as Shakti, has become the 24 cosmic principles. Every single thing in this world, every single human being, every soul, every living entity is also that same God. Everything is Shakti. Everything is divine consciousness, he would teach. And he would say, he said this elsewhere in the gospel, the Divine Mother has kept me, she hasn't kept me as a jnani, she's kept me in the state of a vigyani. So he's speaking on the basis of his own spiritual experiences of vigyana. But this raises a controversial issue. The, the issue is this. He also often used to say that most souls are not fortunate enough to be able to attain the state of vigyana. He gives the example of climbing up the stairs of a roof, and he says that when you climb the stairs, you leave them behind one by one, and he likens that to the process of neti neti vichara, discriminating, saying, Brahman is not this world, it's not this, it's not that, until you reach the roof. And he says most people, when they reach the roof, they stay on the roof and they leave the body within 21 days. What is that roof? Attaining knowledge of non-dual Brahman, 
in the state of Nirvikalpa Samadhi, most people don't come back. He says ordinary souls, jiva kotis is the technical term he uses here. Ordinary souls, ordinary jivas can only get that far. But then he says there's a special category of soul which he calls ishvara kotis, which he defines in one place in the gospel as obotarva obotarir ongsho. Avataras, incarnations of God, and those who are born as portions of an incarnation. Only these Isvarakotis, he seems to say at some places, are able to, after reaching the roof, again come down, up and down the stairs, and realizing something very different from what you realize. On the roof, when you reach the roof, you feel Brahman alone is real, everything else is unreal. Everything else is like a dream. But the Vigyani, the Ishvara Koti, is able to go up and down the stairs realizing that, wait a minute, but the stairs are made of the same materials as the roof, bricks, lime, and brick dust. But this, this realization, this further spiritual realization, you can call it Brahma Satyam Jagat Satyam, Brahman is true and the world also is true, is not open to everybody, it's seemingly. But this is controversial. Why? Because I think there are some complexities here. In other places in the gospel, Ram Chandradatta, who was a householder devotee of Sri Ramakrishna, he kept hearing these teachings on Vigyana, and then he finally, in a bit of frustration, in, in a moment of peak, we can say, says to Sri Ramakrishna, but you, all that stuff you're talking about, these high realizations, that's not for us ordinary people, householders. And then his answer is very interesting. It's roughly along the lines of, I'm not saying it's not that it's not possible at all for householders or for you know, non ishvara kutis, but it's very difficult, is something that he seems to be saying. So in any case, it's a little bit complicated about whether all of us are capable of attaining the state of Vijnana or not. Let's just assume that not everybody can attain it. It'll make it even more kind of, um, it'll make my point stronger, I think. Why does Sri Ramakrishna go on again and again about a spiritual state, which he calls Vijnana, which most of us are never going to attain? This is the question. And my answer, my, my humble suggestion, is that it's because he thought that even if you don't attain that state, it's incredibly valuable for spiritual aspirants to, a, to try to cultivate the attitude of a vigyani in our day-to-day -day spiritual lives. And I want to give you two examples of this. One is found not in the gospel, but in Leela Prashungo, the great biography of Sri Ramakrishna written by Swami Sharadananda. Most of you know this, I'm sure, but I'll say it again. Shibgane Jibe Shiva. Serve others in a spirit of worship by trying to see God in everyone, in all living beings. One of his most important teachings. Now, one thing to note about this is that you can't ground this ethical teaching in Shankara's classical Advaita Vedanta metaphysics. Because according to Shankara's school, from the ultimate standpoint, living beings as individual souls are unreal. This is all a dream. And if I'm in a dream, and, I re and I'm lucidly dreaming, let's say, right? this would be the equivalent of Advaita Vedanta, I'm a lucid dreamer. Would the lucid dreamer in a dream bother to serve the dream, the figments in that, in that person's dream? the figments of his or her imagination? No, it doesn't make any sense. If I know that they're not real, why in the world would I do anything to help them? So Sri Ramakrishna's ethical teaching, Shiva Gyane Jivir Seva, serving others in a spirit of worship by seeing God in everyone, is grounded directly in his own philosophical teachings about Vigyana, this different spiritual philosophical worldview, Brahma Satyam Jagat Satyam. It's only if the world is real and that the people that we're serving are real, that it even makes sense to engage in this practice of Shiva Gyane Jiva Seva, serving others in a spirit of worship. So that's one example. Another example, very concrete, very practical in our day-to-day -day lives. One of the things that he said that every spiritual aspirant has to conquer is lust. So what would he tell men? He would tell male devotees, try to look upon every woman as a manifestation of the Divine Mother. And sometimes he would say, as Sita. And to female devotees, he would say, try to look upon every man as a manifestation of Rama. Here again, there's a direct link. There's a direct basis in his teachings on Vigyana, this, the, the viewpoint of a Vigyani. Because it's only if you think of every human being as God, as a manifestation of God, that these spiritual practices can even get off the ground. Okay.
I haven't so far mentioned Sri Ramakrishna's wife, but I wanted to mention Holy Mother Sharada Devi as well, um, and how she also often grounds her teachings on spiritual practice in very lofty philosophical teachings. One of her most well-known teachings is one that she gave just about five days before she left her body. She says, I'll say the Bangla first and then I'll just... She says, Judi shanti chao ma karo dosh dekho na. Dosh dek pe nijed. Okay, first, if you want peace, don't look at other people's faults. Look at, try to look at your own faults. This is similar, you, many of you are familiar with the Bible, to Christ's teaching. Why, look at the, why focus on the splinter in another person's eye and ignore the, the giant wooden beam in your own eye? So it's very similar. But after this is where it gets really interesting. She says, Jogot ke apnaat kore nite shekho. Kyo pod noi ma, jogot tomar. Learn to see this entire universe as your own. Nobody is a stranger. Nobody is actually different from you in reality. Jogot tomar, the world is yours. And literally, every, because everybody is God. So notice what she's doing here. She's giving the deeper philosophical basis for her teaching about not finding fault in others. What is that basis? That basis is Advaita, but in this different non-Shankarite sense of Brahma Satyam Jagat Satyam. Everything is God and everyone is God. So what sense does it make to find fault in other people? They're not other people at all, in fact. Nobody is other to you. Everybody is God in different manifestations, different forms. So I actually think that this teaching goes even deeper than about not finding fault in others. I see this as her equivalent of Sri Ramakrishna Shiva Jnana Jiva Seva. What she really means is, if you really see everybody as God, you can't help but serve them and love them. But again, notice how it's grounded in this Vigyana Vedanta kind of metaphysics. Brahma Satyam Jagat Satyam. Everything is real, everyone is a real manifestation of God. And the third teaching I wanted to mention, I could, I mean, this could go on for hours if I were to parse every one of his philosophical teachings, but another one I wanted to mention. Ma uh, Sri Ramakrishna would often say, the aim of life is the attainment of God or the realization of God. Remember again, going back to that beautiful statement that Bhikkhu Bodhi made about the uh, Samyak Drishti, this, the foundation of all Buddhist spiritual practice is the right view. He says, he gives this really nice analogy. He says that if you're trying to drive somewhere and you don't know where you're going, what are you going to do? You're going to end up wasting all your gas but going nowhere fast, right? You, what is the destination? So Sri Ramakrishna tells us, the aim of all spiritual practices is to realize God. That gives us an orientation for every spiritual practice we engage in in our day-to-day -day lives. We should always remind ourselves, what's the purpose? of this thing that I'm currently doing, whether it's prayer or japa or vichara, anything. Because it's easy to get caught up in the minutia of it or maybe it becomes dry or mechanical, but that's why it's very important and Sri Ramakrishna would always hammer it into our heads. Never lose sight of the goal of all of your spiritual practices. It's the realization of God, nothing less. Now at this point, some people will say, well, that's, that's too high-pitched an ideal. It's not practical for me. And so Holy Mother again comes to our rescue. Because you'll find her again and again. Of course, she'll talk about God realization as the ultimate aim of spiritual practices. But she gives something, the way I put it is that she emphasizes even more what I would call the proximate goal of our spiritual practices, something that's more directly practical in our day-to-day -day lives. She would often say, what happens when you do japa, when you take God's name? You purify the body and you purify the mind. And ultimately, your desire for sense pleasures diminishes. This is extremely practical. And it's less sort of high-pitched, you can say. And another thing that's useful about this teaching, this, I think it's another way that I think it's more practical, is that you can track your spiritual progress in a certain way. Look at yourself now, and imagine that you started spiritual practices 10 years ago. Look at yourself 10 years ago, at what you were 10 years ago. And you can, God realization is an all or nothing affair. You either realize God or you haven't, right? But purifying the mind is something that, that there are many, many stages, right? It's, it's just like you, when you're scrubbing a kitchen, you know, it, beca it starts filthy, and then the more you scrub, the cleaner it becomes until ultimately it becomes spotless. Same thing with our minds and our hearts.
So that's something we can actually track if we're honest with ourselves. And our guru can also help us. But we can ask ourselves, how, you know, how, how many impure thoughts, how many worldly thoughts was I thinking 10 years ago? And after 10 years of spiritual practice, now where do I stand? So now, that was all just to give you, and as I said, this is the tip of the iceberg. There's so, I can talk about so many other of Sri Ramakrishna's philosophical teachings as forming the basis of spiritual practice, but I gave you those three as examples because I still have five other points I want to make in the course of this talk. Remember, I said there are six ways in which Sri Ramakrishna himself taught that philosophy is essential to every spiritual aspirant's life. And I've only talked about the first one, which is philosophy as the basis of spiritual practice. Okay, but now the second one. You'll find that there's another category of philosophical teaching in the gospel. Sri Ramakrishna would often give teachings that would encourage the people visiting him to broaden their minds, expand their minds, and to avoid becoming fanatical or one-sided in their spiritual path. In fact, he said in one place, Je shei lok. that person who has harmonized everything, that person is a true human being. He would often say this. Uh, l uh, let me read, the, this is from that same quotation. He says, the person who has harmonized everything is indeed a real human being. Most people are one-sided, but I find that all opinions point to the one, capital O. All views, the Shakta, the Vaishnava, the Vedanta, have that one for their center. She who is formless is also with form. And it is she who appears in different forms. These are very high philosophical teachings about the nature of God, about the harmony of religions, right? And he, but he's telling it to everyone, all spiritual aspirants, as a way of pushing against some of their tendencies to become a little bit one-sided, a little bit exclusivistic, a little bit fanatical, thinking that their path is the only path, or at best, they'll say, other paths aren't wrong, but they're lower than mine, they're inferior to mine, they can take people, spiritual aspirants, part of the way, but not, not as high as I am. I'm on the peak of Mount Everest, and these other guys are kind of, I'm looking down at them. So no, he constantly taught philosophy, very high philosophy, to challenge that and to combat that kind of tendency toward fanaticism in all spiritual aspirants. That's something each one of us as a spiritual aspirant has to be very, very careful about. He used to use a, a beautiful analogy. He would say, imagine an infinite ocean under the cooling influence of the wind of devotion, bhakti, that ocean forms into ice in certain places. And, he's, and he likens each of those ice formations to different forms of the personal God. So the infinite ocean is the formless, absolute. The forms of ice are different forms of the personal God, Kali, Krishna, Jesus, and so on and so forth. Then he says, but with the rising of the sun of knowledge, Ganshudya, Gyanasudya, the forms of ice melt. And now, if the, if, the, if the parable stopped here, if the analogy stopped here, then Shankarites would be very happy. And they say that, see, he even admits that with the rising of the sun of knowledge, the forms of ice melt, which means that the forms of the personal God are lower, they're inferior, they're not ultimately real. But he goes on to frustrate even the Shankarites. And he says, but in some places, the ice never melts at all. They become quartz. And he uses this phrase in Bengali, nitto shakar. There are eternal forms of the personal God, which never melt. Hmm? And so he used this philosophical teaching and this beautiful analogy of the ocean to challenge the fanaticism and the one-sidedness of all sorts of spiritual aspirants. Let me just give you a couple examples, and they're kind of counterpoints to each other. One example, Mohima Chakravarti, a householder devotee of Sri Ramakrishna who loved Shankara's Advaita Vedanta, classical Advaita Vedanta. He loved seeing the world as a dream. Even the personal God, not ultimately real. The highest practice is the path of knowledge. Sri Ramakrishna knew all this. That's the background you have to understand. Now Mohima asks him a very leading question. He says, I have a question to ask, sir. A bhakta needs nirvana sometime or other, doesn't he? Nirvana, what does it mean? He's not thinking of Buddhist nirvana here. He means the Advaitic goal of completely extinguishing or merging your own individual individuality in non-dual pure consciousness, which is the goal of Advaita Vedanta. Because according to classical Advaitins, there's no eternal heaven for bhaktas. At best, there's what's called Brahma Loka, which is a higher realm, but it's temporary. And bhaktas can stay there for a certain amount of time, but ultimately they have to be kicked out. 
and it's what's called gradual liberation. At, if, they, if they do things right, if they play their cards right, they can go from Brahma Loka to nowhere. There's no coming and going in the highest state. There's only resting in your true nature as Brahma, non-dual pure consciousness. But they always treat this bhakti ideal as a lower one classical Advaitins. So that's the background. Mohima is asking this question. But devotees of the personal God also ultimately have to, you know, get outside of these eternal heavens and of this Krishna and Jesus and all that lower stuff and ultimately realize their true nature as non-dual pure consciousness, right? And he wants Sri Ramakrishna to agree with him. Sri Ramakrishna does not oblige him. And he says, it cannot be said that bhaktas need nirvana. There is a state in which the eternal Krishna is with his eternal bhaktas. Nitto Krishna ta nitto bhakto. Krishna is consciousness embodied and his abode also is consciousness embodied. Chinmoy sham, chinmoy dham. Krishna is eternal and the bhaktas also are eternal. Nitto Krishna, nitto bhakto. He says, don't think in that way because that's one-sided and it's, and it's condescending. <laughs> this is the way I see Sri Ramakrishna's answer. Never think that way that my path is higher than yours, and that you're good, you're like a preschool, but ultimately you have to come up to my level. I'm, I'm, I'm a PhD holder. <laughs> At the same time, he uses the same teaching, Sri Ramakrishna uses the same philosophical teachings and the same ocean analogy to combat a different kind of fanaticism among bhaktas. <laughs> and you'll find this in the gospel as well. Many Vaishnavas would, would come to visit him, Goswamis, some of these Goswamis, and he had great respect for them, great reverence for them. Goswamis are these people who are kind of like really hardcore spiritual practitioners in the lineage of Chaitanya. And on one occasion, this is recorded in the gospel, he's speaking to a Goswami, and he could tell that this Goswami also had some bit of one-sided, somewhat fanatical Vaishnava leanings, feeling that Krishna is the be-all and end-all. Everything else is okay, but not as high as my Krishna. So what does he say to this Goswami, Vaishnava Goswami? He says, how can you say that the only truth about God is that she has form? It is undoubtedly true that God comes down to earth in a human form, as in the case of Krishna. And it is true as well that God reveals herself to her devotees in various forms. But it is also true that God is formless. She is the indivisible Satchit Ananda, existence, knowledge, bliss, absolute. She has been described in the Vedas both as formless and as endowed with forms with form. She is also described there both as attributeless and as endowed with attributes. Again, he's combating this Vaishnava's one-sidedness in the opposite direction using the same teachings. And then he goes on to bring in the same ocean analogy. Never for a moment say, he says to this Vaishnava, that God is only Krishna or that the highest form of God is Krishna. God is also Brahman in the sense of non-dual pure consciousness, the impersonal absolute. But not just that. There's so many other innumerable forms of the personal God. And never say that my form of God is higher than your form of God, that Krishna is higher than Kali, especially, especially in his time, 19th century. There were fierce sectarian rivalries between Shaktas and Vaishnavas. And then there's this newfound sect called Brahma Samaj, and they have this view that the, they accept God as personal but formless. Shaktas say that it's my Kali, my Durga, which is the ultimate, divine mother, and you Vaishnavas are worshiping a lower God. Vaishnavas will retort, you guys, you Kali and Shaktas, you guys are the ones worshiping the lower God. Our God, Krishna, is the highest. And these Advaita Vedantans like Mohima will go on and say, no, no, you're all wrong. <laughs> and the highest is actually Brahman. So Sri Ramakrishna knew that entire milieu. And, and he used these very, very profound and expansive philosophical teachings to combat the one-sidedness and fanaticism that many spiritual aspirants sort of tend toward. Because one thing that Swami Vivekananda noted is that the deeper your spiritual practice, the, the greater the danger that you'll become a little bit fanatical. And the danger of being very open is superficiality in spiritual life. Being a spiritual dilettante and saying, yeah, yeah, everything is right, everything is true, I accept all paths, but you're not, you don't even have a firm grounding in your own tradition. So, so the real sweet spot is to have infinite breadth and infinite depth, which Swami Vivekananda thought that Sri Ramakrishna was the ideal embodiment of that, of that really unique combination of qualities. Now, Another teaching of Sri Ramakrishna's, one of his very famous teachings, what he's probably most known for, which also explains how he tried to expand the minds of spiritual aspirants, are his teachings on the harmony of religions. The most famous teaching is Jatamot Tatapat, as many faiths, so many paths. But my favorite version of that teaching is 
তিনি অনন্ত পথ অনন্ত তিনি অনন্ত পথ অনন্ত গড ইজ ইনফিনিট অ্যান্ড দ্য ফ্যাডস টু গড আর ইনফিনিট অ্যান্ড ওয়ান থিং দ্যাটস রিয়েলি ডিপ অ্যাবাউট দিস টিচিং এন্ড ভেরি ফিলোসফিক প্রেগনেন্ট অ্যাবাউট ইট ইস দ্যাট হি এক্সপ্লেন্স ওয়াই দেয়ার ইনফিনিট ফ্যাডস টু গড ইটস বিকজ গড ইজ ইনফিনিট বোথ পার্সোনাল অ্যান্ড ইমপার্সোনাল is formless but also can manifest in so many different forms that there are also infinite paths to god it stands to reason that if if god is infinite then there are also so many ways of approaching god we can realize god as krishna by following the vaishnava path we can realize god as christ by following the path of christianity we can realize god as allah by following the path of islam we can realize god as brahman non dual pure conscious by following the path of knowledge advaita vedanta and so on and so forth And there are some places in the gospel where he goes into pretty almost technical philosophy, which might surprise some of you. But, and he says in one place, in Vedanta, there is Shankara's Advaita Vedanta. There is also Ramanuja's Vishta Advaita. He says this, specifically referring to schools of Vedanta, different schools of Vedanta, and accepting both of them as true. And how does he do it? This is very subtle, and I think it's easy to miss what he's doing here. This was in the presence of Naren, the future Swami Vivekananda. And Naren was very smart, and so he, he asked him, he said, well, what, tell me about Ramanuja's Vishta Dvaita. And he went on to explain that according to Ramanuja, he used the example of a bale fruit. He's not saying Ramanuja used it. This is Sri Ramakrishna's own analogy to explain Ramanuja's standpoint. He says, imagine a, a, a bale fruit, a special kind of fruit which you find in India. If you try to weigh this bale fruit and, and only take the pulp, you, the weight of the bale fruit will fall short. You have to take the weight of the whole bale fruit, which means also the seeds in the shell. Likewise, if you just accept the reality of Brahman, non-dual pure consciousness, and, and dismiss everything else as unreal, the weight, of this, the weight will fall short. You have to accept the reality of everything, but as what? As Divine Mother herself. Everything is God, including individual souls, including everything in this world. And the way that Sri Ramakrishna really brilliantly reconciled what seemed to be radically opposing philosophies, Shankara's Advaita Vedanta on the one hand, which accepts the ultimate reality only of the impersonal, non-dual absolute, and the path of knowledge as the highest spiritual practice, and Ramanuja's Bhakti school of Vishta Advaita on the other, which takes Brahman to be only personal. He doesn't even accept non-dual pure consciousness. He doesn't accept the state of Nirvigalpa Samadhi. He doesn't believe in it at all and who believes that the path of bhakti is the highest path. How does Sri Ramakrishna reconcile these two philosophies which seem to be at, at loggerheads? He says, each one of these spiritual philosophies corresponds to a distinct stage of spiritual realization, both of them. He says that Shankara's Advaita Vedanta, Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya, corresponds to what he calls the stage of jnana, reaching the roof. By, by, by going up the stairs one by one, you reach the roof. And you feel that this whole world is a dream because you realize your true nature is non-dual pure consciousness. But then he says, there's a further stage in spiritual realization called Vigyana, which corresponds to Ramanuja's Vishishtadvaita philosophy. Because it's the Vigyani who sees, he, the Vigyani sees the world isn't a dream. I see it as Majarkuti. This is the Bengali phrase he uses, which is very expressive. It means, I see it as a mart of joy, a mansion of mirth. Why? Because there's nothing but the bliss of God. I see nothing but the, 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 but the blissful divine consciousness everywhere. Sri Ramakrishna himself had that realization. He explains it once in the gospel. He says, I'm doing puja one day. Suddenly I see a cat walking in. And I see the cat as divine consciousness. The puja vessels I was using, I saw them as divine consciousness. The door sill, I saw as divine consciousness. This is something that's probably less well known, so I wanted to quote it. It's quite interesting. Swami Turiyanandaji, one of the great monastic disciples of Sri Ramakrishna in Kankal, he was asked by Atulanandaji, a Western monk of our order, Gurudas Maharaj. This is Gurudas Maharaj's question. He's very philosophical, so he asks a very interesting question. Don't Sri Ramakrishna's teachings differ somewhat from Shankaracharya's Maya theory? It's a very interesting question. What does Turiyanandaji say? Yes, Swami Turiyanandaji replied. Shankara taught only one phase, how to get freedom, nirvana. Our master, meaning Sri Ramakrishna, of course, first made one free and then taught how one should live in the world. Be free first. Do away with name and form in the entire universe. Then see mother in all. Then be her playfellow. 
such an important statement, which most of us haven't even heard of. This is found in, with the Swamis in America. What are these two phases? The first phase, he's, it's strictly grounded in Sri Ramakrishna's teachings. The first phase is the phase of jnana, reaching the roof, feeling Brahma Satyam Jagat Mithya. I am that non-dual pure conscious, the world is unreal. But there's a further stage, which Sri Ramakrishna took to be his ultimate philosophy. Remember that he said, Divine Mother has kept me in the state of a vigyani. I accept all states, waking, dream, deep sleep, and the turiya, the fourth state. I accept everything as God, as Divine Mother. So that second phase that Turiyanji is talking about is the stage of vigyana, and that represents Sri Ramakrishna's own philosophy. V That's why I call it vigyana vidanta. Okay, so now I still have four more points I want to make. So I've covered two ways so far that Sri Ramakrishna makes a case for the importance, not just importance, the necessity of philosophy in spiritual life. There are four more I want to get to. So another one. You'll often find every single spiritual aspirant, every, without any exceptions, will face doubts in his or her spiritual life. At some point in your spiritual life, you might face some kind of personal tragedy, or you might not get that dream job that, you, that you've always wanted, or whatever. Whatever it is, but you might face doubts. Well, why does God put me in this situation? Doubts come up in our spiritual lives. In, in Christian traditions, there's a spiritual practice, which is well-recognized, called faith-seeking understanding. I have faith in my tradition. I don't have fundamental doubts about does God exist or should I accept, if I'm a follower of Sri Ramakrishna, should I accept Sri Ramakrishna as an incarnation? No, that's taken for granted. Nonetheless, doubts come up. Sri Ramakrishna himself used to say, and all of the Vedantic scriptures say the same thing, you will never be completely free from doubts until you have realized God. This is a fact. And since that's true, philosophy, philosophizing, is an indispensable help in resolving and alleviating our doubts that come up in our day-to-day -day spiritual lives and our day-to-day -day spiritual practices. Let me give you a couple examples, just two examples, that are both taken from the gospel. You'll find again and again, people who are devotees, these are not atheists, these are not skeptics. Some of them maybe, one of them is an interesting case, Vidya Shagur. He was a great pundit, he's a little more skeptical, maybe agnostic, but anyway. But many of them were not, they were religious, but they still had doubts. Okay? One of the big doubts that many spiritual aspirants have in which they, they would ask Sri Ramakrishna this question, you're talking about this world as God's play, you're saying that God is all loving and that she's like a mother, an infinitely loving mother, and you should surrender to her and that she'll take care of everything. But I'm, I'm, this life is full of suffering. And it seems to be, in some cases, innocent suffering. What did I do to deserve this? What did so-and-so do to deserve this? Not just maybe our own suffering, but looking at the suffering of others. Maybe our, our beloved you know, family members, but also just, you know, you see things happening in the world, which are just troubling. It might trouble any spiritual aspirant. The war going on in Ukraine, for instance. Why does God permit these things? This is the famous problem of evil. To put it slightly more technically, if God is on the one hand all loving, that means that God should not want us to suffer, that's arguably. If God is omnipotent, all-powerful, then God has the means, God is able to prevent us from suffering. Then why does God permit so much, so much suffering in this world? So that these two attributes of God that we commonly accept as religious people, omnipotence and all-loving nature, seem to be at odds with the fact that, there's, that this world is full of suffering. Why does God permit it? This is the problem of evil. This question would come up again and again in the gospel. So w one instance, for instance, is Vidya Shagod, this great pundit who may or may not have been an agnostic, but he was at least vexed. He was a little, he wasn't sold on religion. So he asked Sri Ramakrishna, he says, how do you explain this? And he mentions Genghis Khan. Genghis Khan. He committed mass slaughter, ruthless slaughter of completely innocent people, a massive number of people. And Vidya Shagod, didn't God see this? And couldn't God have prevented it if he, if he wanted to? Why didn't he? I don't want to worship that God. I mean, very, in a very uh, poignant way, Vidya Shagod is raising this question. And Sri Ramakrishna says in response, is it possible to understand God's actions and her motives for acting? She creates, she preserves, and she destroys. Can we ever understand why she destroys? So 
I, I, two chapters of my, of my book, Infinite Paths to Infinite Reality, are actually devoted to unpacking Sri Ramakrishna's response to the problem of evil. I'm not going to go into the details now, but this is, uh, so if you're interested, it's chapter seven and eight of that book. But this response is called, in contemporary philosophical parlance, skeptical theism, which means that why should we even expect, with our finite, puny human minds, to fathom God's ways? Why God does certain things and permits certain instances of suffering, why he, and, and why he you know, prevents other cases of suffering on the other. How can we, why should we even think that we would be able to grasp that? So this is the first, this is not the, the whole of Sri Ramakrishna's response. One thing that's important when you try to uh, understand Sri Ramakrishna's philosophical teachings, especially in the gospel is, don't take them in isolation. Try to kind of harmonize all of them. And, try to catalog and look carefully at all of the places where the problem of evil is raised and look at how Sri Ramakrishna responds to each of these questions. Now I want to ask, I want to mention a different incident where a different person, a neighbor asks, why has God created wicked people? And Sri Ramakrishna gives a completely different answer. In order to create saints, mohot lok toyer korbin bole. One becomes a saint by conquering the senses. This is a very interesting response. And it's not that it's a different or incompatible response with the skeptical theism. They're, they go, they're part and parcel. So what does, he, what does he mean? He means, and he goes on to explain, why does God make us, endow us with all of these, what seem to be inauspicious qualities, lust, greed, anger, and so on and so forth, in order to create saints out of each one of us? How does he do it? Because we learn from our mistakes. We act out of anger, we lose our temper. We hurt somebody's feelings. After that, we feel bad about it. And what happens? We try to control our temper in the future. One simple example of how what seem to be evil qualities, how even suffering. I guarantee you that each one of you probably has learned more from your, in, uh, your moments of suffering than from your moments of happiness, moments of joy. People don't call on God usually when they're happy. They call on God when they're, when they're in, in misery. This is, these are facts. But he also says, he adds three doctrines. He says, karma, Rebirth and universal salvation are also crucial to understanding how God makes saints out of all of us through suffering. Karma, what we reap, we sow. Whatever we do, we're going to have to pay for it eventually, if not in this life, then in the future life, and hence rebirth, these two doctrines. But another thing that gives each one of us hope is that nobody will be left out in the end. Everybody will get their food at the end of the day, some people at 6 in the morning, some people at 12 noon, some people at 6 p.m., other people at midnight, by which Sri Ramakrishna means some people, most people won't get God realization in this life, but everybody will eventually. Maybe in five lives, maybe in 10 lives, maybe in somebody like Hitler, it might take a million lives. But even he, even that, even Hitler, the soul of Hitler, he won't be Hitler anymore, he'll be a saint. But the soul of Hitler will be completely purified and he, that person will, will, will become united with God as well. Nobody will be left out. There's no eternal hell. And so these are very powerful doctrines in responding to the problem of evil. And as I said, just as Swami Vivekananda unpacked this one teaching about Mahut Narayan for three days, one can do that with any one of Sri Ramakrishna's philosophical teachings. And these are invaluable in our day-to-day -day spiritual lives in allaying our doubts that come up. Every single one of us will have these doubts once in a while. You know, somebody passes away whom you're very close to, and you wonder, you start doubting. Why did God do this to me? I have nothing to live for anymore. And these things come in very handy at that time, these philosophical teachings. Another example. Okay, maybe I'll, I don't have time for this. And this is, I have a separate lecture on this. I'll, I'll refer you to that lecture if you want. F on free will and determinism, it comes up again and again. Well, I'll say it very briefly, okay. <laughs> the, 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 the question is, we don't have free will. They're telling Sri Ramakrishna again and again, you're telling us again and again, God is a doer, God is a doer, Ami Jantra, Tumi Jantri, I'm a mere instrument in the hands of God. And at the same time, you're telling us to engage in pra spiritual practices, renounce lust and greed. What the heck, what's the deal? These seem to be contradictory. If God's a doer, then how can I even engage in spiritual practices? I don't have any voluntary, I can't do anything voluntarily. So why don't I just sit around and enjoy life? This is a serious question. A Brahmo Samaj follower says, if it is God that makes me do everything, then I'm not responsible for my sins. He's very smart. And Sri Ramakrishna says with a smile, yes, Duryodhana also said that. Oh Krishna, I do what thou, seated in my heart, makest me do. He's quoting from the Mahabharata, one of our great epics. Kena api devena, ridhistitena, yatha pravrittosmi tatha karomi. 
I do what God makes me do, whether bad or good, so I, I'm off the hook <laughs> for all the bad things I do. And then Sri Ramakrishna says, if a man has the firm conviction that God alone is the doer and he is the instrument or she is the instrument, then he cannot do anything sinful. He who has learned to dance correctly never makes a false step. What is he saying? These are very subtle philosophical teachings. He's distinguishing two standpoints. One standpoint is, it's only when you realize God that you can fully internalize the fact that God is a doer and that you are the non-doer. And once you realize God, you can't take a false step. You can't commit sin because you're an instrument of God and God won't make you commit sin. But so long as you've not realized God, you have to believe that you are free and morally responsible for your actions. Why do you have to believe? Because he says in another place, God has implanted in us the illusion of free will lest we commit more sin. So there are two standpoints which you can't mix up. So long as we have not realized God, we have to take responsibility for our actions and we have to engage in spiritual practices. And the moment we've realized God, we know that we're the doer, uh, we're not the doer, that God is a doer, but at that point we can't commit sin anymore. And somebody might say, well, well but you're telling us now as, as unrealized souls that we we're not free. And he says, yeah, go ahead and try to live like you're not free and see how far you get. And the moment you step out this door, you're gonna feel like you're the doer walking out of the door and then all of your, all my big teachings about God being the doer fly out the window. This is, so again, deep philosophical teachings which help us to resolve doubts that come up in our day-to-day -day spiritual lives. Okay, I'm gonna have to zoom through these a little bit, but four, five, six. Four, he also taught there's a specific kind of philosophizing that is not just philosophy, it is a spiritual practice. Shodashod bichar. This is something he would often teach. Even the bhaktas, sadasad vichara. Discriminate, discern between what? The permanent, the eternal on the one hand, which is God alone, and the impermanent, the transitory. February 2nd, 1884, a devotee asks him point blank, Upaiki, what is the way? Just tell me what I should do as a spiritual aspirant. Sri Ramakrishna says, discrimination between the eternal and the transitory. Then, one should always discriminate to the effect that God alone is eternal and the world impermanent. One little note here, as I often do. Swami Nikolanji, in his translation, kind of tilts this teaching in a classical Advaitic direction by translating as, one should discriminate to the effect that God alone is real and the world unreal. <laughs> But this is actually not what Sri Ramakrishna says. It's sat and asat. And he explains sat as the eternal and asat as the impermanent, but still real. So the world is impermanent, but real. Very much like in the Gita. Anityam asukam lokam imam prapya bhajasvamam. Worship me, God, Krishna, knowing that this world is impermanent and devoid of happiness. So, and then he says, bakulhoi dakwa, daka, daka. One should pray with sincere longing. Both these practices, on the one hand, discriminate, discern between what's eternal and what's transitory, and on the other hand, combine that with prayer, intense prayer, with tears in your eyes, with sincere longing for God. The two have to go hand in hand. So philosophy is inseparable from spiritual practice. It's also a kind of spiritual practice. It's a kind of viveka, vichara. Okay, fifth. Sri Ramakrishna, in one place, he also endorses a special kind of philosophizing. And it's a very interesting exchange. It's when Swami Vekananda, himself, Narendra, is talking to M, the author of the gospel. And Narendra was a student of philosophy at Scottish Church College. And so he quotes a really interesting statement made by William Hamilton, who is a, a kind of less well-known Western philosopher, a Scottish philosopher. The statement is, he, this is recorded in the gospel, a learned ignorance is the end of philosophy and the beginning of religion. And then Sri Ramakrishna asks M, what does that mean? Because he says it in English. And so he, then Narendra explains the sentence in Bengali. The master beamed with joy and said in English, thank you, thank you. Remember I said in his repertoire, half dozen English words, this is another one of his English words that he would often use. Thank you, thank you. He's so pleased to hear this teaching, translated into Bangla, that he thanked Swami Vivekananda, Narendra. A learned ignorance is the end of philosophy and the beginning of religion. One thing to keep in mind is Hamilton, the Scottish philosopher, was in the tradition of Kant, this great German philosopher. One of his most famous books is called The Critique of Pure Reason. So what Kant did was he philosophized to arrive at the limits of philosophy. It's a very interesting idea. And he says, 
I have had, I'm doing all this philosophizing in order to make room for religious faith. He used that exact phrase, in order to make room for religious faith. So this is exactly what Hamilton is saying. Through all your intellectual speculations, if you can arrive at a, at a, at a standpoint of intellectual humility, philosophy humbly recognizing its own limitations, then philosophy becomes the greatest help in spiritual life. How? Because you open the gateway to religion. You become open to possibilities beyond what the five senses can grasp. In one place, Sri Ramakrishna says about Dr. Sharkad, a homeopathic doctor who is very skeptical and he's a scientist. He prided himself on being a scientist. He says he didn't accept incarnations. And Sri Ramakrishna said, how can Dr. Sharkad, how can Sharkad, how can the doctor accept a reincarnation? It's not found in the newspapers. It's not found in his science. And he uses the word science, the third English word in, in one lecture that Sri Ramakrishna uses. You don't find that in, he doesn't find that in his science. And he's poking fun at him, right? So anyway, another kind of philosophizing that Sri Ramakrishna strongly encouraged, which delighted him and which he thought was very powerful, is philosophizing, speculation that ends at a place of humility where you open yourself to spiritual possibilities beyond what the finite mind can imagine. That's why he would often say, can a one seer pot hold 10 seers of milk? How can the finite human mind understand spiritual truths, spiritual realities? Hmm? And finally, this I'll say very briefly and then I'll end it. I think it's a false dichotomy to assume that philosophy is dry speculation and that spiritual practice is something completely different and has nothing to do with spec I think this is a false dichotomy and one of the reasons is because if you go to the etymology of the term philosophy in both the Indian context and in the Western context, you get a very different picture. Let's start with the Indian tradition. The word for philosophy, there are many, but one of the words, one of the main words is darshana. What does it mean? Reasoning? No. It means seeing or vision. Every philosophical worldview based on Vedic traditions in India is grounded in spiritual vision, spiritual realization. So it's not, it's never about dry reasoning. The reasoning has a purpose and has a metaphysical foundation. You reason in order to ultimately realize the spiritual goal of life, which is liberation in Indian traditions. What about Western traditions? Philosophy goes back to the Greek. Philosophia, two words, philo and sophia. Philo means love. Sophia, what does sophia mean here? Wisdom, actually. To, to think of, to translate sophia just as dry knowledge is actually not correct. Wisdom, and it's a kind of spiritual wisdom. So philosophy in its etymological sense in the West means love of wisdom that issues an existential transformation. Pierre Hadot, who's a French philosopher who wrote a very influential book called Philosophy as a Way of Life, subtitle, Spiritual Exercises from Socrates to Foucault, 1981. And he said, if you go back to the original philosophers in ancient Greece and Rome, the Stoics, the Epicureans, the Platonists, the Neoplatonists, like Plotinus, you'll find again and again that philosophy was never understood in the sense of dry theoretical knowledge. It always is inseparable from spiritual practice. And you have to act in accordance with the philosophical principles that you believe. Plotinus was a great mystic, actually. Plotinus was a Neoplatonist. And Hado says about Plotinus, he says, according to Plotinus, one cannot know the soul if one does not purify oneself of one's passions in order to experience in oneself the transcendence of the soul with respect to the body. And one cannot know the principle of all things if one has not had the experience of union with it. It's remarkable, this is pure Vedanta. And this is Plotinus from over two centuries ago. No, maybe not, oh no, sorry, not two centuries. Almost two millennia ago, but not quite two, two, two millennia ago. But a long time ago. So if we take philosophy in its deeper etymological sense, both in the Indian context as darshana, or in the Western context as philosophia, love of spiritual wisdom issuing an existential transformation, then there's no reason to even assume that philosophy is opposed to, to spiritual practice. Philosophy is actually inseparable from spiritual practice. In some forms, philosophy is a form of spiritual practice, and you cannot engage in any spiritual practice coherently and effectively without holding some philosophical views. So I'll end on that note. Let's pray to the divine that each one of us as spiritual aspirants can not just understand 
Sri Ramakrishna's philosophical teachings, the philosophical and theological teachings in all of the world's great religious scriptures, the Bible, the Quran, Buddhist scriptures, but that we can assimilate these teachings and internalize them and practice them in our daily lives. Sri Ramakrishna would often say, when some pundits would come to him, they would, they would recite some scriptural verse, and Sri Ramakrishna would say, Dharana hai. You, you should assimilate these teachings. You have to assimilate them. Again and again, he would say, don't just say them like a parrot. Practice them in your daily lives. Thank you. Some brief announcements. First, there are refreshments outside. Outside or inside? Inside, because it might rain. In the White House, what's known as the White House. Second, are there, is there a Q&A in the greenhouse? There's going to be a Q&A now for anyone who has questions about my lecture uh, in the greenhouse nearby. Thirdly, next Sunday, 26th of March, 11 AM, Swami Chidekananda, a monk who is based in Advaita Ashram Kolkata, he is going to give a lecture on the following topic, Sri Ramakrishna's Bhava and the Ramakrishna Mission, Challenges in Harmonizing the Ideal with the Real. Does that cover the announcements, or should I say anything else? I think that's all right. Om Shanti 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 Hari Om Tat Sat Shri Ramakrishna Rupanamastu